For three decades, the Family and Medical Leave Act has allowed millions of workers to take care of themselves and their families without fear of losing their job and life-saving benefits like health insurance. My husband has uh, had, I'm sorry, psychiatric uh, problems, and I never knew when I might have to ask for um, sick leave, time off. It was comforting to know that I didn't have to disclose why, but if I had that coverage, it could say that I needed to be off. Today, we think of FMLA protections as integral to family life and the well-being of the nation's workforce. It's just common sense that workers are more productive when they are healthy in body and mind. And it seems obvious that a work and home life balance, the ability to be there when the people we love need us the most, is essential in a society that values the dignity of work and working families. But 30 years ago, the passage of the Family and Medical Leave Act was nothing short of revolutionary. Facing entrenched opposition, a broad coalition that included advocacy groups, unions, and religious organizations coalesced around the idea that workers should not have to choose between their jobs and their health or the health of their families. They fought hard for the right of working parents to have time to bond with a new baby or welcome an adopted or foster child into their homes. They fought for the right of workers to care for a sick child or to give back to their own aging parents facing serious health challenges. They fought for the right of workers to take leave for their own illnesses, whether battling cancer or chronic disease or a mental illness. Four times a year, I actually have to get infusions, and um, yeah, it makes a it makes a huge difference when when you're able to care for yourself. If I wasn't able to go ahead and get my treatments, um, I definitely wouldn't be able to stay healthy enough to to stay out there and be able to do the things that I love to do. And since its passage, the protections of the FMLA have been expanded to provide vital support for our nation's military families when they are preparing for deployment or dealing with illness or injury. With millions of workers taking FMLA leave each year, there is no doubt that the law has improved the lives of millions of working families. Yet too many workers don't take the leave when they need it. Some fear they will be labeled or stigmatized if they take leave, and some workers may not even know they have FMLA leave protections available to them. I think that if more workers knew about the Family Medical Leave Act, they could definitely benefit from it. I think there are maybe some who don't know about it who would definitely use it if they did. The job protection and continuation of health insurance provided under the FMLA are vital to ensure that workers don't lose their jobs when they welcome a new child into their family or lose their insurance coverage in the middle of a serious medical event. But because FMLA leave does not have to be paid, many workers, including more than 60% of low-wage workers, have to take unpaid leave. For most people, taking unpaid leave leads to difficulty making ends meet, and all too often people either end up having to take less time than they need or cannot afford to take any leave at all, even when recommended by medical professionals. January 1st, 2018, my mom uh, got a diagnosis that she had cancer, it had come back and it was stage four. Ultimately, it ended up taking her life within about six to eight weeks. After having the issue that I did with my father of not having paid, paid leave, um, it financially really put me in a, in a bind for almost about eight to 10 months for me to financially recover from my dad's passing. Um, and luckily, I didn't have that with my mom. I was able to be there. Um, I was able to be present, not have to worry about my bills, uh, getting paid, um, and, and try and make the, the best, uh, you know, time that I had with her. The Department of Labor is committed to ensuring more workers can take time away from work when they need to care for themselves and their families. The Department of Labor is dedicated and assistance to empower them to assert their rights without fear of retaliation. In addition to making sure workers know they have the right to take job protected leave, we remain committed to enforcing the law so that workers can actually take FMLA leave. Over the last 30 years, we've protected thousands of workers who have been denied leave, have lost health care coverage during leave, or have been unjustly terminated for taking leave. I never want to have to be that person to, to not be able to be there for a loved one when they need me the most. So whether it's, you know, at birth or, you know, in those final moments, like that's something that I really don't want to have to step away from because 
you know, I have to make a decision between a paycheck and, and not having one. Working families are the heart and soul of this country. And at its core, the FMLA reflects the dignity and compassion that working families deserve. No matter where you live, where you work, or who you call family, you deserve the right to be there to provide care when needed. And at the same time, we know this, every worker and every family across this nation needs and deserves paid family and medical leave. As we commemorate the 30th anniversary of the FMLA, the Department of Labor honors FMLA's champions and celebrates the lost success. For three decades, the Family and Medical Leave Act States Congress and in this United States of America, uh, president of the AFL-CIO, first female woman elected president of the AFL-CIO. Uh, Liz Schuler's here with us. Thank you, Madam President, uh, for being with us today. Uh, Jocelyn Fry, president of the National Partnership of Women and Families, a longtime leader in this issue, but also uh, including working in the White House with my First Lady Michelle Obama. So thank you very much for, for being here as well today. All the work advocates that are here today, uh, Chris Garcia, Yvonne Lamangi, Trisha Gallagher, thank you for sharing your stories. Um, I already mentioned uh, Julie Sue. I want to thank Deputy Secretary Sue for, for her partnership and friendship. Jessica Luman, who leads our Wage and Hour Division, and the team that enforces the FMLA and other protections. Uh, Lisa Gomez, our team at EPSA. Wendy Chung Hoon, Director of Women's Bureau. Uh, Assistant Secretary Taryn Williams, our Office of Disabilities and Employment. Uh, James Rodriguez uh, from VETS. Um, and I think I left a lot of people out in this room, and I shouldn't have, but I want to say thank you to all of you. Uh, the reason why I think it's important to be recognized is that um, the work that I get up here to talk about and the work that the second gentleman and, and the, the secretary get a, get a chance to talk about is really the folks that work with us every day's work. Uh, and I think it's really important to acknowledge the people that came before us and the amazing work that they do and the work people we work with every day. So thank you. Um, FLMA, FMLA is a critical part of our efforts at DOL to build an economy that works for all people. The truth is everybody should be able to take leave uh, when they need it. Uh, and there are many valid reasons for taking leave, uh, but they all have one thing in common. It's called living life. It's about supporting families. 
Uh, we are all human beings. Uh, we get health conditions, cancer, surgery, mental illness, and, and other, other things, and we need leave. We need to be able to support our families. People have complex pregnancies. They give birth. They care for a newborn. They need leave. FMLA applies to all these different things that I talked about and, and many, other, many other opportunities that people need leave for. Uh, we ask military members to deploy and put themselves in, at risk in their family sacrifice. They need leave. They, had co they are covered by FMLA. Uh, we have loved ones. We drop everything to help them uh, when they need, they, they drop everything to help us when, when, when we need them. We need to be able to do the same thing. A parent, a spouse, a child, we need leave. In all, leave is granted under FMLA, FMLA for over 500 million times since the law was enacted. Think about that for a minute. 500 million times this law helped families get through a situation, get through a difficult situation when otherwise they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have had that opportunity. And think about the opportunities, what, what this law has done for many people in America. It shows that this law has, has and is and was and still is badly needed. It makes a real difference. Here's a story about uh, we, how we work on here at FMLA at the OL. Jaron Brown is a grocery store worker from Florida. Last year, he got seriously ill. He went on leave. He was fighting for his life. Before he could get better, his employer fired him. So we got in touch with the Department of Labor here in Washington. Our wage and hour division in Miami investigated. They found multiple violations. They got Jared not only his job back, but they recovered over $12,000 in back wages and over $5,000 in medical expenses. The business got the message, and you need to follow the law. The DOL is enforcing the law. These cases happen every single day. Not every outcome is the same, but we need to talk to our businesses to let them know the importance of this. And missing from that opportunity is a more common is vulnerable workers, including low-wage workers, women, black workers, Hispanic workers. Workers in underserved communities, quite honestly, won't, won't say anything because they're afraid to say something because they're worried about getting fired. And all, all this, they don't know where they turn to. And that shouldn't be happening. So we have our work cut out for us and work to do. We are raising awareness both among employers and workers in the United States of America to let them know that this law exists. This law goes to that business. FMLA is the law. It's here to help you. But we also have to acknowledge something else. Many people can't afford to take unpaid time. And on the 30th anniversary of FMLA, I join President Biden and Vice President Harris and everyone in this room by saying it's time for the United States to, pay, to pass paid family and medical leave for all workers in the United States of America. This is something I know we can do. When I took office as mayor of Boston in 2014, one of the first things I did was look at our, our policies, our paid policies. There was no parental leave. So we created the first ever six-week paid leave in the city of Boston. Two years later, we're able to double that to 12 weeks. The budget people said it's important for us to do it. It applied to the non-union workers in City Hall at the time because you have to negotiate a contract. But every single union after that just simply asked for it. It wasn't negotiation. It got put in the contract when they asked for it as we move forward here. So people in City Hall have that. And I said, it's good. It's important for us to do it. And you know what's remarkable? It didn't bankrupt the city of Boston like other businesses said it would. As a matter of fact, we, have a huge, we had a huge surplus. I think we still do. But we had a huge surplus. And we're able to treat our employees fairly. We got fiscally stronger as a result of this because our workforce got stronger. And that's what paid leave policies are all about. They're not about leaving uh, people out of the workforce. They're about keeping people in the workforce. They're about making sure people can overcome challenges. They can be keep being productive. They can keep, keep supporting their families. Ultimately, it's about dignity, uh, the dignity of working people. It's about respecting working people's rights. And it's the reason most people work in the first place, to take care of their families so their families can have a better life. As the president said, it's about building, building an economy from the bottom up and middle out. And it's not just simply about having a good job. It's about having a good job with good benefits that respect the workers in our country. And we need to respect the workers in our country. It's really important. One of the other things I'll just quickly say, and uh, I was told to go off the script a little bit, so I am. When I'm... Um, <laughs> In the beginning days of this administration, there was a lot of, a lot of conversations about, about people resigning, the great resignation, leaving work and going to other opportunities. They were going to other opportunities because the other opportunities were better for them. 
The other opportunities provided more money. The op other opportunities had better benefits. The other opportunities understood that they respected workers. That's why people were leaving. It was nothing new. It was something that workers in the past couldn't do, but now they had opportunities and options. And when you think about it now, you think about companies, some of the companies I've spoken to since I've been Secretary of Labor, when they offer paid family leave, their retention is longer. Their recruitment is better. Their respect for their employees is positive. The workers are happier because they have an opportunity. If they need to do it, they can take care of their families and other members in their family. That's something that's really important. So today we celebrate the 30th anniversary of FMLA. And I think it's really important for us. I know we all want to make sure what I just said about paid leave is important, but we can't underscore the importance of this law 30 years ago because nothing existed for employees 30 years ago. And for 30 years, 500 million times, this law has helped Americans and workers in this country to be able to support their family. So we can't take away from the importance of this law. We can build on what this law's intention was and how it's changed 30 years later what we want to do, but we can't forget that. We need to reaffirm our commitment to implement and enforce, raise awareness about rights and stigma about mental health and taking leave, and demand paid leave for every worker in America. And I want to say, again, thank you so much for being here. I've had the opportunity. And, and quite often, when I talked about my, set, my, my time as mayor, it's many of you. You led, the, you led the way where, where my team in City Hall in Boston said, let's do something special here. So I want to, again, thank you for that. It's my privilege now to introduce someone you all know, the second gentleman of the United States of America, Doug Emhoff. He's a proud husband. He's a devoted father. He also has experience and accomplishments as an attorney. He's worked tirelessly to share the values of this administration with the American people. I've had the chance to travel with him and to see him firsthand that when he's in front of an audience and he's talking to an audience about issues he cares about, I've also had a chance to talk to him privately and understand those same issues that he talks about publicly, he talks about privately. He's taking this job very seriously. He wants to make sure that he takes the message of this administration, his wife and the president around the country to let them know the importance of these issues. That connection that I talk about is rooted in his family and in, in the love in his family and how he takes that love to the people of the United States of America. It's a devotion he models every single day. So I'd like to ask all of you to please join me in giving a warm welcome. And this is not his first time at the Department of Labor. He's been here many times and he's probably halfway up the ramp and back down the ramp. But it's, it's, welcome to the Department of Labor again, the second gentleman of the United States of America, Doug M. Hart. Marty Walsh. <laughs> I love saying Marty. Um, but he is, uh, you heard it, he is just such a leader, not only uh, for the working folks of the United States, but such a leader in our country, in our administration. And I'm, I'm really happy to call you a good friend, as is the Vice President. So thanks for all you do. Marty Walsh. <laughs> well, he gave my speech. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reiterate a lot of those points, and I have a couple of new ones. So, uh, but as, as he said, for 30 years, the Family and Medical Leave Act has made a massive difference in the lives of millions of Americans. That, what was it, 500 million uh, times, which is really incredible over the last 30 years. As we know, the Act currently allows Americans to take up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave after the birth of a child, to care for a loved one who's sick, uh, all without losing existing benefits, and so many other things that have developed over these 30 years. The law changed how we work and how we care for our loved ones. And today, it lays the groundwork for the fight that we're still fighting and must fight. Paid family and medical leave for all Americans. What does the existing law mean for all the millions of Americans out there? What does it mean to their everyday lives? It means that a parent doesn't have to choose between keeping a job and caring for their newborn. It means that an injured or seriously ill service member or veteran knows that they can rely on a loved one to take care of their needs. 
and it means that a person living with a serious health condition can take some time off from work to heal or to seek necessary medical care. I want to say thank you to all the, all the folks in this room, the advocates, the trailblazers who fought so hard to make this law a reality 30 years ago and continuing the fight for paid family and medical leave today. So thank you for all you've done, and thank you for all you continue to do. It means so much. Along with so many of you in this room and advocates around the country, we had leaders, as the Secretary said, uh, at the White House last week who understood the importance of putting working families first. Both Republicans and Democrats came together to pass this law and to recognize that our nation's workers, their families, and the realities that everyday Americans face. Since then, the Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division has helped workers understand their rights under this law. The DOL has also provided support to employers to help them comply with the law. 30 years ago, our country united around the belief that family and medical leave would create a stronger and better future for everyone. And as we celebrate FMLA, we know there's more work to be done. I know that under the leadership of this administration, President Biden, Vice President Harris, we will continue to push to finally get paid family and medical leave once and for all. It's the right thing to do. Too many parents, too many parents aren't able to care for their children without missing a paycheck. Too many people are still working while they're seriously ill. And too many women are unable to take time off after the birth of a child. Let's be clear, nobody should fear losing their job because of their families or their own health. Again, it's not right. Speaking from personal experience now, we need to normalize taking leave. We need to normalize it. It's okay to take leave in this hardworking society of ours, especially for men. I encourage men out there to take leave when you need it. There should be no stigma, not a sign of weakness to take time to care for your family or a newborn. Uh, this is something I, I regret. I had two children. Um, 28 and 23 years ago, and I didn't do it. And I regret, I've regretted it every single day since. I wish I would have done it. So I'm encouraging men out there, take the leave when you can. It's important. Paid family leave and medical leave is an issue for all of us. So we should all feel comfortable talking about it and taking that leave. So let's just do that. President Biden, Vice President Harris, my wife, <laughs> I like saying that, sorry. Uh, <laughs> they're taking steps to address the challenges that we have here. The Vice President, as I know and I, you know, has always been a fierce advocate for ensuring that families have the resources that they need. She continues to urge the business community to establish childcare priorities and policies, and she champions them when they do that. And during the height of the pandemic, the Vice President was a leading voice for working mothers who were forced to leave the workforce due to lack of care options for their children, which was just not fair uh, during that Zoom world. Too many women had to take a step back. It was not fair. Vice President spoke out for child care providers right on the front lines, many of whom run small businesses and many of whom are women of color. The Vice President said time and time again that when women succeed, our whole country succeeds. And when workers are empowered, our whole country is stronger. And I'm proud to say we have had some su success recently. The President signed into law the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. <laughs> the Pump for Nursing Mothers Act. and significant investments in child care all through the uh, end of year omnibus. But we are not done. 
We've all said it. We're going to keep saying it. We need to pass national family and medical leave. We need to do it. It is the right thing to do. Paid. Thank you. <laughs> this administration will continue to fight for investments in child care and other resources that will help working families and women. We know that progress does not happen by accident. It is hard fought, and it takes time. But we know that making the working the lives of working families better is worth fighting for. And a lot of you have done that for your whole careers, and you'll keep doing that. And now, it is my privilege to introduce another leader in our administration, in our country, and someone who has been fighting for families for his entire career. Uh, and I've got to see that close up because he's also a fellow Californian, a former congressman, and my attorney general, he actually uh, came after uh, Kamala Harris when she left for the Senate, and now they're both here in the cabinet. So um, he and I, like Secretary Walsh, we do a lot of work together because the work that Secretary Walsh does and the work that Secretary Becerra does just affects millions of people's everyday lives, and that's the kind of work that I want to be doing uh, as second gentleman. He's fighting... Uh, for your rights, he's fighting for women's health care, and he's here with you and with us to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Family and Medical Leave Act to honor working families. So please join me in welcoming the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, my good friend, <laughs> Secretary Becerra. <laughs> We should give it up one more time for a guy who takes a backseat to no one when it comes to championing some of the most important causes of our time. The second gentleman has been there on so many issues. I know because the Department of Health and Human Services has had a count on him. When there have been crises, when people have been gunned down in mass shootings, he's been there. When it comes time to make sure that all people have an opportunity to work and get paid their full wages, he's been there. Uh, I hope that you will recognize that we are very fortunate to have not just a great team and the president and the vice president of the United States, but the first lady and, of course, the second gentleman have been absolute stars when it comes to championing the values that this president and the vice president have been talking about for the longest time. So one more time, if you might, for, before he walks out the building. I want to thank Secretary Walsh for inviting me to be with you. This is special for me. I'm going to get to hand it off to Deputy Secretary Julie Su, who's like a partner in crime with me on so many things, uh, to Jessica Lumen, who I know has been instrumental in making it possible for us to make the fight for paid family leave, for Wendy Chu Hoon, who is fighting with, at the Department of Labor as well on behalf of women. Where's Rosa? Rosa Dolor. Uh, the battle scars that I have, I, I, it's like the, the stitches go from my arm to the, to the chairwoman's arms uh, because we've been in so many fights together. It is a phenomenal treat to see that she's actually taking the time to be here. Congresswoman Underwood is also here, and I want to thank her for being a champion so quickly and taking on the mantle of so many different leadership roles. Uh, I know that Jocelyn Fry with the National Partnership for Women and Families We'll probably have a chance to make you fight even harder. Uh, I understand that Chris Garcia, one of our workers, is going to be saying some remarks, and to Liz Schuler, who I remember way back when, when we were in the trenches back as well. I think it is fabulous that the leader of the labor movement is someone who understands that not all of the labor movement has been able to come fully forward, and it is great to see a woman as the leader of the labor movement. And Liz, it is fabulous to see you here today. And to have a Department of Labor that is not shy about inviting the leader of the labor movement to the Department of Labor. And so I'm going to say something that I've said all my life. I was a brother to three sisters. I am the father to three daughters. I have been a congressman. Uh, 
Deputy uh, Attorney General and now Secretary in, uh, in places where most of the folks that I count on look just like you. And uh, to everyone who is making this fight because it's time for FMLA 2.0 to move us forward to get us to pay family leave. I want to thank each and every one of you because it's not just today that you're here. You were there before 30 years ago. I know some of you were there and many of you have been there since. So most importantly, to those of you who've taken the time to be with us, thank you for the fight. Uh, and thank you for getting us over the finish line because we're going to get there. We're going to get there. It's just a matter of when. But when we get over that line, I know the same faces will be among that crowd as well. So thank you for everything you do every day to get us over the finish line on paid family leave. Thank you. So I just got to mention a couple of things, and I hope uh, Secretary Walsh uh, grants me a little bit of a uh, personal privilege here. First, I got to say to him, um, it feels phenomenal to have a former labor leader as the Secretary of the Department of Labor. Uh, it's kind of strange to have to say that, but it is a tribute and a treat to our president, and it makes someone like me very proud. My father, if he were still here, would say, I am very proud to see Marty Walsh as our Secretary of Labor for two reasons. One, because he came out of the laborers, International Laborers uh, Union, which is my father's union. He is the, my father is a pension member of the laborers union. He was before he passed. And the second reason I think he'd be very proud of Marty Walsh is because he'd say, and just like me as well, he talks with an accent, you know, accent. <laughs> Either way, I, I think we are very proud that, uh, Marty, you are the man who carries that torch for so many people, and it is good that it feels authentic to have the secretary of the Department of Labor be the guy, the person who gets to lead the fight on, on behalf of working men and women. One of my very first votes as a member of Congress, in fact, the very first big vote that I cast in the House of Representatives in 1993, Family Medical Leave Act. That was one of my big votes. I remember that. Maria, I, rem I remember that. And it was so important that as a freshman member, I instituted a policy, at least in my office, where we provided eight weeks of paid family and medical leave to my staff. Small as it was, we still made sure that if you took that leave, you got some pay as well. And it is time. After 30 years of still struggling and fighting for that, we still have so many Americans who still don't have that. So I believe that we're going to win this, and that's why it is so important for me to have a chance to be here with you. At the end of the day, it's just about dignity, what we're talking about, right? We want to we wanna really make this real for everyone. And it cannot be real for everyone if you say, go ahead, take some time off. And then you say, well, I'd love to. I, I know I, I, under the law I, I can but I can't afford to. How do you have peace of mind if you can't really take advantage of what the law gives you? It's what we're fighting right now with health care. So many Americans who still don't have full access to health care. Peace of mind means that you are confident that when you go in, when you can, the next day, or whenever it is to work, you're going to give your all. Peace of mind means that when you go to work, you don't have to worry about where your kids will be because they will have a safe place, whether it's school, daycare, but you want to have that peace of mind. There's no way you have peace of mind if someone in your family, loved one, is terminally ill, is gravely sick with COVID, is in need of someone's attention, and you can't really be there. Peace of mind is where we need to go. And until we tell people, you can take that time off and don't worry, it won't hurt your pocketbook. We will not have that peace of mind for all Americans. And so I hope you will fight with me to make sure that we give all Americans, not just paid family leave, but the peace of mind that must come with it to, that, to say that we earned this for the American public. And finally, as I said, FMLA 2.0, it is time. This is America. It is embarrassing to know that so many other countries in the world have gone way beyond us. Somehow we still lead the pack but not on this. And so we have work to do. I know the secretary at the Department of Labor is gonna push this as hard as he can. And I believe that if we do this right, we will give everyone a chance to have that peace of mind and we will give everyone the respect they need. 
My parents, only because my dad was a union member, did he have peace of mind. Uh, a guy with a sixth grade education who spoke with that accent, mother who came from Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico when she was 18, when she married my father. None of them had a chance, neither one of them had a chance to go on to get that college degree. They had to earn what they had and they had to do it with their hands or the best they could. And I will tell you that if something were to happen that would require their attention, they would have been wondering. There would have been no peace of mind. And so to my father, who is now passed, but my mother, who is a ripe 89 and still doing her walks, I say to each and every one of you who are championing family and medical leave, do not stop. There are people who look to you. They pray a rosary for you at night, and they thank you for everything you do. Because at the end of the day, you're doing what is American what is part of our American values. You're making sure that you respect someone who worked hard, as hard as they could, and you're dignifying that work. So thank you on behalf of those, people, those parents, the son of a very proud uh, immigrant uh, family, telling you that we're gonna do this. We're gonna cross that line together, and we're gonna make it happen because you got a leader at the Department of Labor who's gonna make sure, and with him is that deputy secretary who is a, another partner in crime from California of mine, Julie Sue has been just awesome to work with over the years, and she is gonna make sure that before she leaves, she's gonna have carved her name into every room in the Department of Labor <laughs> in some way, because she's gonna leave a mark. And let me now introduce to you the De Deputy Secretary of the Department of Labor, Julie Sue. Thank you so much, Secretary Becerra. The fact that one of your first acts uh, was to vote for the FMLA, and now you stood here as our nation's Secretary of Health and Human Services is yet another reason for us to celebrate today. Uh, so I just want to echo and join our Labor Secretary, Marty Walsh, and welcome you all to the Department of Labor. Um, I feel like 30 is one of those ages where you're no longer a youngster, so like you can look back on some accomplishments that you've made, um, but you also have a lot of room to grow and to build on what you've done. Uh, and so it is with the FMLA. Uh, as the mother of two daughters who are now 19 and 22, I am incredibly thankful that I was able to take leave after the birth of my children. Um, both because I liked having time with my babies and because being a new mom is really hard. <laughs> it's hard emotionally, it's hard physically, it's hard mentally. Um, I also needed to leave when my mother was sick and uh, she was in the hospital and I um, stayed with her in the hospital and then when she came home and lived with me for a while and needed her wounds cared for and her IV monitored, um, I had leave. And I've always been very lucky to have been able to make choices that were right for my family and also um, where my respects for, for where my requests for leave were unquestioned. So many workers, as has already been said, have not had that choice. When the needs of a job are at odds with at, at, at odds with or in competition with the needs of your loved ones, working people and let's be real, mostly working women, are faced with incredibly um, untenable choices. Finding balance is really impossible, as are uh, the peace of mind the Secretary Becerra talked about and the sense of security the Secretary Walsh talked about. That's why the passage of the FMLA was so essential. American workers wake up every day uh, to fulfill two goals, getting the job done and providing for the daily needs of the household. So the commitment to work and family is really deeply interconnected. The FMLA, has, as has already been said, allows parents to bond with and care for their children. It acknowledges the significant um, challenges and demands that young children and aging parents place on working families. And it recognizes that when we're sick and in need of medical care, we need time to heal. And we need to do all that without fearing losing our jobs. But even though those ideas are common sense, the fight for basic workers' rights has never been easy. So first introduced in 1984, the right to job protected leave was repeatedly blocked. But workers and their advocates did not give up. In fact, they, you, 
organized. You pushed at the state and local level. In fact, before the FMLA was enacted, nearly half of states had enacted family and medical leave laws of their own. These state and local laws help build momentum and, de and demonstrate what could be done at the national level. It galvanized coalitions that were instrumental in pushing for a national law. And it showed federal lawmakers how such laws actually benefited their own constituents and helped them to recognize that a federal FMLA would benefit workers across the country while also, and Secretary Walsh mentioned this too, about the role of employers, that it would level the playing field for businesses. The history of the FMLA's passage provides us with a lesson on the important work, sure, of elected leaders, um, but of workers and advocates, on the strategy of shaping hearts and minds until something that once felt impossible becomes possible, and on the power of finding common ground. Organizations and individuals with different interests united around this fundamental notion that the health and well-being of working families mattered more than their differences. And because of that, millions of families have benefited from the FMLA over the past 30 years. Under the FMLA, it is estimated that over 50% of black, Latino, and Asian American workers in our country, and 45% of indigenous, Pacific Islander, or multiracial workers have access to job-protected leave. Now, these numbers are clearly nowhere near high enough, particularly when the strongest predictors of ineligibility for FMLA are low wages and family poverty. But today, we celebrate making what seemed impossible possible. And while we celebrate what happened 30 years ago, it's important to note that much has happened since then. Workers and advocates did not stop at the FMLA. In the 30 years since, you have continued to fight and win actually securing paid leave in states and cities around the country, including in my home state of California, where millions of workers now have a guaranteed right to wage replacement if they need to take time off to care for themselves, a new child, or a loved one. So to the workers advocates in the room, on behalf of Secretary Walsh and all of us in the administration, we thank you. We know that you continue to do what must always be done in order to make progress. Organize, raise up your voices, build a wave of public sentiment, and bring it to bear in the halls of power to make change. So today is not just a celebration of a law, it's a celebration of worker power, of women's power, of organizing and advocacy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> You've already heard it said, President Biden and Vice President Harris have made it clear that this administration is, is going to continue to fight for the needs of workers, including paid family and medical leave. And together, I know that we will continue this fight. So speaking of the people and organizations who made the FMLA possible and who continue to push us all to imagine a world where more is possible, I want to introduce our next speaker, the amazing Jocelyn Fry, president of the National Partnership for Women and Families. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Secretary Sue, and I love saying Deputy Secretary Sue for that very kind introduction, uh, Secretary Walsh, and really the incredible, amazing entire Labor Department team. Thank you so much for bringing us together, for hosting this amazing event. Uh, to the second gentleman, Secretary Becerra, and all the members of the administration, thank you for your work in support of working families. Representative DeLauro and Representative Underwood, who I know will be with us, um, I can't say thank you enough for all that you do for, for all of us every day. And, and to all of you, all of the advocates who are here present and who are watching, um, thank you for all that you do. And it's really a privilege to be in the fight with you on a daily basis. And it is really a privilege to be here to mark this milestone 30th anniversary. 
Um, enacting the Family and Medical Leave Act was groundbreaking. It fundamentally changed the conversation about care and work by establishing an essential baseline standard to help workers meet their work and family obligations. Before the FMLA, an employer could fire somebody who needed to take time off or caregiving or they could just decide not to hire workers who they thought were more likely to have care responsibilities like many women. Since 1993, Americans have relied on the FMLA on more than 460 million occasions to care for themselves or their loved ones, which is an extraordinary achievement. I want to spend my time today talking a little bit about history. The history of the FMLA is something that we at the National Partnership deeply cherish. In the 1980s, we were still known as the Women's Legal Defense Fund, led by our then president, Judy Lichtman. Our work <laughs> and our work included a particular focus on combating gender-based employment discrimination. Our legal director at the time, Donna Lenhoff, wrote the She wrote the early draft of what would become the FMLA, in part to ensure that workers wouldn't face discrimination simply because they had or might have care responsibilities. But the history of the FMLA is not simply a story about one person or one organization. It is a story about the power of coalitions. The FMLA coalition was diverse, it was dedicated, it was persistent, and it collectively told the story about the need for leave. It included organized labor like AFSCME, SEIU, AFT, and of course the AFL-CIO to make the, cl the case clear that access to leave was a basic labor standards issue. There were groups focused on constituencies with unique care needs, like AARP representing seniors and the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund representing Americans with disabilities to deepen understanding of the diverse needs, care needs of workers. There were faith-based organizations, including the U.S. Conference on Catholic Bishops, to connect the dots between workplace standards and broader values that we say we hold around care and fairness. There were leading researchers and even business organizations to push back on the narrative that argued that jobs would be lost, the economy would blow up, businesses would be harmed, and all of those you know, opposition arguments. And there were the, those who were fighting for the rights for children, for parents, for healthcare workers, and of course women, all sharing their personal stories. It was this very broad, diverse coalition that helped to secure bipartisan FMLA champions in Congress and mobilized public support across the country. Even so, it took nine years to enact the FMLA. It survived two presidential vetoes before President Bill Clinton signed it into law in 1993. But we knew that the FMLA was only the first step. And now the next step is to secure comprehensive paid family and medical leave for every worker. So while today is a moment for celebration, it is also a moment for rededication. And what we've learned from the FMLA's history is that our success in enacting paid leave will be deeply connected to the breadth and depth of our coalition. Fortunately for us, we have that coalition in place. We have groups like Moms Rising and Family Values at Work and the National Domestic Workers Alliance and the Black Women's Roundtable and the other nearly 30 groups that now make up the steering committee of the incredible Paid Leave for All Coalition all of them lifting up the diversity of care experiences and care needs. We have brilliant research and policy and legal analysis from organizations like A Better Balance and Center for American Progress and Center for Economic Policy Research and the Center for Law and Social Policy, the Institute for Women's Policy Research and New America's Better Life Lab to make the economic case. And we have Main Street Alliance and Small Business Majority to make the business case. We have partners like the Care Can't Wait Coalition with groups like the National Women's Law Center, SEIU, Campaign for a friendly, family friendly economy, caring across, genera caring across generations to make the case for robust, comprehensive care investments. 
and we have the breadth of the civil rights community, like the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, to elevate paid leave as a racial and economic justice issue. And most importantly, we also have the groups who were there at the beginning, the breadth of the labor community, AARP, the disability community, like groups like the ARC, who were there at the beginning and they'll be there at the end. And the National Partnership will be there too, because we don't want to be left out, as part of this really powerful coalition to push collectively for progress that we all know we sorely need. That's the power of the FMLA's history. And it is the power of the FMLA's ongoing legacy today, which is still relevant, still relevant as it was 30 years ago, and will be still relevant until we get paid leave across the finish line. Now I'm very pleased to turn the program over to a leader, leader who will be there for all of those fights ahead, the incomparable president of the AFL-CIO, Liz Schuler. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. Um, incomparable. Well, I like that. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Secretary Walsh, who is not only my Secretary of Labor, but my union brother. Um, I'm just so proud and appreciate being included today. Um, and also, what a remarkable lineup. Uh, how do you beat that and follow that? Um, obviously, Jocelyn, thank you for the history lesson, because I think we're all reflecting and um, certainly having Secretary Becerra here, uh, Deputy, Deputy Secretary Julie Su, um, Administrator Loomis, uh, Congresswomen, uh, both Deloro and uh, Underwood are here, I know. Um, but I'm proud to bring the voices of workers into this room. And I am representing 12 and a half million working people, uh, 58 unions, but really all working people. And I know we're going to hear from some workers, which I always feel is the best spokesperson, uh, spokespeople for um, for these issues. I'll, I'll just say I was 23. I'm just outing my age right now. When this passed, um, and when it was signed into law, I was right out of college. I was an organizer with my local union, IBEW, the Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. The sisterhoods implied. Um, <laughs> And I was helping organize clerical workers at Portland General Electric. Um, and I just was looking at all these powerful women fighting for all of us. Um, I was just a, a lowly little organizer in Portland, Oregon. Um, and I looked to these powerful women. Um, Judy Lickman was mentioned, um, obviously Donna Lenhoff, Deborah Ness. But Karen Nussbaum, who was leading the Women's Bureau at the time and came out of the labor movement, um, you know, I could go on and on about all these powerful women in the labor movement, but the point is it was a coalition, as Jocelyn said. We can do this when we have all the pieces put together. We know how to do this. But I just think about for 30 years, just slogging through, battling it out, organizing, and then winning which feels really good when we win. So that millions of women in particular, as we know, families could have a more balanced life and care for themselves and their loved ones. And that inspired me then as a 23-year-old organizer and it inspires me now as an almost 53-year-old leader in the labor movement. Um, and I'll just say that FMLA stayed alive because of those tireless activists and thousands of others who told their stories and the power of storytelling and really showing up in these fights. And the FMLA stayed alive because we had politicians who put good policy ahead of party. And the FMLA stayed alive because activists and working people and organized labor would not let it die. And because we knew that every person, every worker, every family deserved that basic dignity. And we knew our economy and our country would be stronger for it. And as much as today is a celebration, it also needs to be a reckoning. It needs to be a reckoning. We have been on this stepping stone for 30 years. 30 years, an entire generation of working people. So this fight does not end here. This fight is more urgent than ever. 
because nobody should have to choose between taking care of a parent or relative or losing a paycheck. No new parent should have to choose between spending time with their new baby or making enough money to pay rent or buy groceries. And I know there are some politicians here in DC who take their paid leave for granted. And I would just say open invitation, come talk to fast food workers with me who are dealing with this, hotel workers, baristas, meet the tens of millions of Americans who wake up and face these choices every single day. And then we can talk about why we are the only industrialized country in the world that has not yet figured this out. And the FMLA should remind everyone of one more thing before I wrap here, that the labor movement does not quit. 30 years ago, we fought alongside family leave activists until we got the FMLA done. Here we are three decades later, still standing shoulder to shoulder with activists on the ground fighting for paid family leave fighting for affordable, high-quality child care. And we're going to keep taking that fight to big business, to special interests, and we're going to keep organizing with our great partners in this administration. And we're going to deliver dignity and respect to every working person and every working family in this country. Thank you so much. And it is now my pleasure to introduce the next speaker who works tirelessly to help ensure workers are paid what they are owed and can exercise their rights to take job protected leave when they need it. What a concept. Please welcome Principal Deputy Administrator for the Wage and Hour Division, Jessica Lumen. Okay, this is really cool. Just, just putting that out there. I mean, I, I, to get to stand up here after so many great speakers, before some other great speakers, um, to get to work in the Wage and Hour Division under the leadership of Secretary Walsh and Deputy Secretary Sue in the administration that cares about working people and working families. It's a huge privilege and an honor and a pleasure uh, to really get to talk about FMLA and the role that we get to play in the Wage and Hour Division in terms of making sure that workers get those rights every single day. Um, I was saying a little bit earlier that, um, you know, when people ask me, what is the wage and hour division, right? You know, it's some agency in a department. They know what the Department of Labor is because we're, you know, awesome. But <laughs> the wage and hour division, we're one part of this amazing organization, this amazing administration. And what I say is, okay, I'll tell you what my job is. My job is I get to wake up every single day and help 148 million workers in 10 million workplaces across this country. That's what we get to do. And that's what the FMLA is about. The FMLA is a critical component of the work that the Wage and Hour Division gets to do. It's foundational to our commitment to equity and empowering workers and working families. Year after year, the Wage and Hour Division's FMLA resources are used by workers and employers alike to better understand their rights and their responsibilities. In case you haven't checked it out, our webpage is our most visited webpage for FMLA, and it uh, gets visited almost 9 million times a year. I often say that if there's 148 million employers and we have 9 million people, that, well, you know, you can do the math. Um, but the Department of Labor still estimates that workers, particularly low-wage workers and workers of color, don't take leave, either because they're unaware of their FMLA protections, they're concerned about being treated differently for taking leave, or even though their job is protected under FMLA, they cannot afford to take unpaid leave. When they're unaware of their rights and afraid of repercussions, workers struggle. Our challenge and responsibility is to reach out, to connect with workers where they live and work, to let workers know that they have rights and that we are here to help them when their rights are violated. Across the country, the Wage and Hour Division is engaging in, with stakeholders and community leaders, members that are all here, as well as in communities across the country. Um, and since the enactment, we have held trainings, Wage and Hour outreach and education trainings with over 1 million participants. Our 200 local offices have developed innovative partnerships to connect with underserved communities. And last August, we partnered with the Women's Bureau and the EEOC I think some of our EEOC friends are here today. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, we've partnered to kick off a year-long event series on maternal health 
emphasizing that expected mothers have rights under FMLA and other laws. We're also here to make sure that employers, employees, and healthcare providers have the most help, up-to-date and helpful information they possibly can to support workers who need FMLA leave. And in the coming months, this is a kickoff, by the way. In case you didn't know, this is a FMLA kickoff um, of the way that we are thinking about celebrating and building on what the FMLA has done for us over the last 30 years and what it needs to do for us in the future. And we will continue to work on with our sister agencies to, and stakeholders on the challenges to increase awareness, reduce stigma, and address access. At the end of the day, though, the, the Wage and Hour Division, one of our major responsibilities is that we are an enforcement agency. And uh, since the law was enacted, since the FMLA was enacted, Wage and Hour has completed more than 60,000 FMLA enforcement actions. We have helped workers who were denied FMLA leave, workers who were unjustly terminated for taking FMLA leave, workers who faced discrimination, were not restored to their same job or an equivalent job after their leave, and workers who lost their health benefits while on FMLA leave. The Wage and Hour Division's mission is to protect and enhance the welfare of the nation's workforce, and we will continue every day to help make the promise of FMLA a reality for the welfare of our workforce and the well-being of their families. So the impact of the FMLA over the last 30 years is reflected in the stories of workers who have exercised their rights to take job-protected leave to care for themselves and their families. What is more important than being there, showing up for someone they love? You all heard from Chris Garcia on the video a little while ago. The experience of Chris Garcia illustrates the profound effect that FMLA leave can have on workers and their families. I'll tell you a little bit about Chris. Chris worked for an auto parts store when his father required a quadruple bypass and he was repeatedly denied leave. He was given just a few days for precious days with his family for the surgery. But when his father declined after the surgery, Chris was told he could not take leave because no one else could cover his shift. Chris received the call that no one wants to get. While he was in the middle of helping a customer at his job, the doctor called to ask Chris about taking his dad off life support. In the end, Chris was not able to provide comfort to his dying father or to grieve. It's hard to imagine a more heart-wrenching and dehumanizing workplace experience. In contrast, several years later, Chris was working for a wireless phone company when his mother was diagnosed with cancer. Chris reached out to his manager. His manager immediately began to process for Chris to take FMLA leave. The manager worked with Chris to provide intermittent leave to ensure Chris could be with his mother as much as possible during her illness. And when Chris's mother passed, he was able to be there with her. He could comfort her and tell her what a mom always wants to hear, that he would be okay. So Chris was planning to be here with us today to share this experience about how he was able to use FMLA and also how he wasn't able to have leave. But sadly, he was involved in a car accident last night. He's fine, he really, he's fine, and he wanted us to share that he truly wishes that he could be here speaking with everyone in person. So Chris, you're in our thoughts, and we are grateful that you are okay. It is now my honor. It is now my honor to welcome our next speaker, who has joined us today to share her story um, about taking job protected leave and what it meant to her. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Moms Rising member from Chesapeake, Virginia, Yvonne Lamondi. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. It is a great event. Thank you for having this. My name is Ivan Lamangi, and I live in Chesapeake, Virginia, with my partner and my son, Maximiliano. He's four years old, four going on 16. <laughs> and he recently finished cancer treatment. And I'm also a proud member of Moms Rising. And family leave is an issue so close to my heart. And the protections provided by the Family Medical Leave Act have been essential for my family. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my story today. I work for a bank, and like most working families, we need our incomes to live our lives. 
And that's why I was so grateful that when I gave birth to Max, my employer provided 16 weeks of paid maternity leave so I could recover physically, adjust to a new life as a mom, bond with my baby. And this time really did give me the opportunity to recover. And when I returned to work, I was better positioned to focus on my job, succeeded in my role, because I had that time to recover. Becoming a parent, for me, was a dream come true. But it's no secret that the newborn period comes with a lot of challenges and steep expenses. I have no idea how I would have done if I did not have an income, if I had to come back early to the workforce. I don't think I would have been able to do it. This is why I'm so grateful. Just 20% of private sector workers in the United States have access to any kind of paid leave through their employers. That is not right. It forces many families to make really hard choices. So when I was expecting, a lot of you can relate to this, a lot of people ask you, what do you want the baby to be? What do you want the sex of the baby? And we typically say, we just want a happy, healthy baby. That's what we want for our children. So I couldn't have known that I would need family leave again just 18 months later when Max was diagnosed with leukemia. And our world really turned upside down. No words can adequately describe how it feels to care for your baby as he battles cancer and undergoes under chemotherapy. Not to mention the overwhelming stress of keeping an immunocompromised baby safe during a raging pandemic. But since Max's diagnosis, I have needed time away from work to care for him as he battled for his health and for his life. And fortunately, I am covered by the Family and Medical Leave Act, which means I can take 12 weeks of leave each year to manage Max's treatment without worrying about losing my job and just as equally important, my health care. That has been a critical lifeline for my family because without these protections or the ability to take unpaid leave, I may have needed to leave my job, which a lot of families do. And then how would we have been able to pay the bills or cover Max's treatment? Taking unpaid leave causes significantly strain into our family's budget. And the last thing you want to worry about when your baby is sick is how to stay afloat financially. All in all, over the past two and a half years, I have probably taken about 12 weeks of intermittent FMLA while Max has battled leukemia. Today, like I've said, I am so thrilled and relieved to tell you that as of October of last year, he finished treatment. So he's our survivor today, and he still remains in remission. Thank you. Thanks. And now I am able to go with him to survivorship clinic, where he gets monthly labs, physical exam, and referrals to specialists as needed. And throughout this journey, really, I felt incredibly lucky to have a flexible and supportive employer. But luck shouldn't have anything to do with it. No one should have to worry about losing their livelihood to be there for a loved one when they're needed the most. The Family and Medical Leave Act is an essential foundation, but so many workers aren't covered. And lack of paid leave means family face many impossible challenges and threatens their financial security. As a member of Moms Rising, I have connected with so many parents who have faced similar challenges. Our stories are similar. Some stories are different, but the message is the same. We all deserve care. We all deserve time to care for our loved ones, for ourselves, in time of joy, in time of sorrow. I am proud to be part of a movement to raise awareness of the importance of family and medical leave and to fight for a brighter future for our kids our families, businesses, and our economy. We can't wait another 30 years for pay leave. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the next speaker who has spent years working to secure paid family and medical leave. Please welcome Deputy Director for the Women's Bureau, Gail Golden. Thank you so much, Yvonne, for sharing that powerful story. Um, I know that just like Yvonne, there are about 500 million similar stories of using FMLA, and it's so meaningful for us to take the time to hear it, and, and thank you so much for being here. 
So the FMLA changes lives, as we've all been talking about this morning. And because of that FMLA, people can keep their jobs. And crucially, as Yvonne said, they can also keep their health insurance when they need to care for themselves and for their families. As Deputy Director of the Women's Bureau, I know what this means for working women who are more likely to do the caregiving in their families. But I also know what it means for men because the FMLA is truly gender neutral. Every worker who meets the criteria is eligible for the same protections. True gender equity requires both that women have equal opportunity in the workplace and that men have equal opportunity to provide care. And while the FMLA was historic and an incredible accomplishment, as we've heard the President and Vice President and Secretary Walsh and Secretary Becerra and uh, the Second Gentleman and Deputy Secretary Sue and all of us reiterate today, it was a first step and it's time for the next step, paid family and medical leave. Currently, access to paid leave is not equitable. While women take more and longer leave for caregiving, they are also more likely to have to take that time unpaid. Black workers have less access to paid leave. Low wage workers are significantly less likely to have access to paid leave, and yet they are the least likely to be able to afford to take that time off without pay. When leaves are paid, it doesn't just promote equity in theory, it happens in practice. Men take more parental and caregiving leaves when it is paid. This continues to pay dividends for years down the line. Fathers who take parental leave spend more time on caregiving even after their leaves end. You know, there are many benefits of paid leave and they are well established. And these positive effects tend to be strongest for people of color and low wage workers, two groups that are very likely to overlap. Over the past 20 years, states across this nation have created paid family and medical leave. And I'm excited to say that just moments ago, the Women's Bureau launched a website about state paid leave laws. So if you're unfamiliar with it, please do check out our website for information about where they exist, research, and data on them. So when the FMLA was only a handful of years old, I guess it was in elementary school, if we're talking about it being a 30-year-old now, um, <laughs> I had two experiences that changed my own life. I broke my back and I became a mom. In one year, I needed FMLA twice. I was so thankful that I wouldn't lose my job, but I also experienced firsthand the difference paid leave could make. Over the years, I've heard from others too about their own experiences. Moms whose labors turned into medical emergencies, dads who had to care for terminally ill children, spouses grappling with how to care with another one with early onset Alzheimer's. We all have joys and sorrows in our lifetime and being there, being present when we are needed the most, that's what this is all about. The celebration today was made possible by all of you, by your incredible voices, your stories, and obviously your tireless work. So thank you. And it is my absolute joy and honor to introduce our next speaker who has been an inspiration for, to me and I'm sure to many of you. And she is a key reason we are all here today, a true champion for working women and their families and of course, paid leave. Please welcome Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, wow. Thank you. Um, it's been an extraordinary couple of days. Uh, Thinking back on the, just a couple of days ago at the at the at the White House, of uh, the evening spent with you, Jocelyn, and uh, the partnership and the throngs that are gathered there, 
um, and now this afternoon. And as I reflect on, on, on this time, and I had this thought while I was sitting there at the White House uh, the other day, that, um, and not after listening to remarkable speeches by you know, President Clinton and President Biden, uh, but the fact of being in that room and being in that room with individuals who 30 years ago, 30 years ago, understood that what families needed, what was going on in the lives of American families, and yes, more for women at that time than men, but understanding that men could take advantage of this as well, but understanding that the federal government had the ability, the strength, the power to be transformative in the lives of families, change their lives for the better, make sure that they could be, Gail, where they were needed where they were needed. And that spoke so clearly and loud to me of what it takes to be leaders, what it takes to transform our society, and that that's what this is all about. That's what that vision and collective vision and engaging the power of the federal government and coming together from the outside and the inside and making something happen that has transformed people's lives. That is what government is about. That's what our founding fathers knew. And they were mothers too, probably. But that's what they believed, that we should press the edge of that envelope to make the institution do what it is supposed to do to give opportunity for people and their lives. And I think about myself in that context, that you never know, you know, when my father asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I told him I wanted to be a tap dancer. <laughs> God's honest truth. And I probably would give it all up if I could be on the stage <laughs> tap dancing. But I suppose you tap as fast as you can these days, Secretary Walsh. You know, you do. But to think of, I think about my own path, and I think about, you know, the forces around my, my life that brought me to this place uh, where I could participate in what has for me been a, the most remarkable experience of my life, uh, to be engaged and involved uh, in an institution and working with people who have that vision uh, and understand why we serve, why we serve for no other reason than to help make a difference for folks. So I'm so grateful to all of you for having me here this afternoon, being with you, Jocelyn, the other night, and with you and with Judy and others and the in, in, in the White House, you have to pinch yourself now and again. And I suppose if you don't do that, it's time to go home. It's time to go home. So I say a thank you to you, Gail. And you know, what's so wonderful about, we're always gonna fight for the Women's Bureau. I promise you, I promise you that, and I promise Wendy that as well. And you know, they gotta be probably coming for us, but we're ready, we're ready, we are ready. But you know, I just reflect on your, of being state senator in Rhode Island and making Rhode Island the third state with paid leave, um, the first state to ensure that everyone who used it had the right to return to work. And I can remember going to Rhode Island when David Cicilline invited me to come to speak and talk about family and medical leave. And I send my, you know, my love to Wendy, who can't be here this afternoon, but her work with Family Values at Work, the National Network, uh, grassroots coalitions, won more than 60 new paid leave policies, new rights to 55 million workers and their loved ones. So I just send my love to her as well. And Mr. Secretary, I don't know what to say. You know, in, in Italian, we have that word simpatico. And then when I met you, 
And uh, in this incarnation, we are joined at the hip. And you know that whatever I can do and be for the Department of Labor, I am there for you every step of the way. And I thank you so much uh, for all of your efforts. Uh, recognizing Secretary Becerra, we sat in many meetings, leadership meetings, and all we had to do was to look each other in the eye and knew where we were coming from. And we could begin each other's sentences or end the sentences. The first gentleman, wonderful for him to be here uh, today. Again, Jocelyn, someone the other night, I guess it was Dawn who said, brilliant and, and, and gracious, and that you are an, an unbelievable uh, leader. And I can remember we're, we're, we're battles, I guess when you were in the White House, we were fighting back and forth, not fighting, but we were strong words about what we were doing and what we were going to do. Uh, and uh, 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 Liz, what can I say? How wonderful it is to have you as president of the AFL. Wow. You know, life has changed. It really has. The environment has changed for all of us. Yvonne, really, your story and the stories, that's, that's what this is about. You are what this is about. Your baby, Max, is what this is about. And so God bless you, and God bless you for telling your story as well. Jessica, thank you. It's a pleasure to work with you, and we are going to do as many things as we can, and with child labor, with forced labor, with all of these issues and wage, you know, we, we're, going to, we're going to help to make the, make the difference. You know, and I was, I, f I first invited uh, Speaker Pelosi to New Haven uh, to a gathering we had about paid leave. And one woman who spoke, and none of us can ever forget that it was a long time ago. Her name was Eva, a bus driver. And she spoke about her life and that she um, drove that bus and she would see women at the bus stop with their children and oftentimes with tears in their eyes with a child that was not well or sick but had to put them on the bus uh, because she couldn't, the mom could not take a day off because she would lose her job. And that story has stuck with me all of these years, but it is so typical of the millions, the 500 million stories that are, that are out there uh, today. And I want to just say, and I'll get to this part of it, because you all know my, my story, but I think about you, Judy. I think about Donna, and I think about the others who were engaged. And um, you never let up. You never let up as you dealt with Senator Dodd, or anyone else, <laughs> or anyone else. And you know, they slipped a lot of things into the legislation <laughs> that others didn't know what was coming, but it got in under the wire. But the, what you have done and accomplished, you know, these are hallmarks of your life and the milestones of your life when you've made such a tremendous difference. And as I think about, Senator Dodd, who first introduced the bill in 1984. Um, and uh, my experience goes, was, um, my experience with Senator Dodd goes back to when I managed his, uh, his uh, Senate race in 1986 and diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Uh, he said, go get well. Job's here. Salary's here. I was also going to be the campaign manager for the campaign, taking a leave from the Senate office. And he said, my campaign doesn't start until you come back. Doesn't start until you come back. My friends, I don't know many United States senators who would pause their campaigns to wait for a, uh, an employee who was, uh, who was sick. Um, and I was with my mother when she drew her last breath of life after six weeks. She passed away five years ago at age 103, tough as nails, <laughs> tough as nails. But no one said, sorry, Deloro, job isn't there anymore. We have to find someone else to sit in your place. So, you know, and I said this, I'll say it over and over and over again, because yes, Liz, members of Congress and now probably most of their staff members can take family leave and get paid for it as well. But if it is good for staff of, 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 of congressmen and 
uh, and it was, it's good enough for us who serve in the institution, then it's good enough for every single person in the United States. And that's what we need to do. I, I won't go, you know what it does? Time off, new child, sick yourself, spouses, parents, millions of Americans, crucial step for working families today. 15 million workers take FMLA leave every single year. But in the decades since its passage, we leave countless others behind. Some workers' jobs are not protected. And we have legislation now that is looking at that in the House. Some workers are not eligible. Some can't afford to take the leave because it's unpaid. 88 years ago, FDR signed into law the Social Security Act, which meant economic security for older adults. 29 years after that, LBJ gave, gave us Medicare and Medicaid, health care for seniors and for our most vulnerable. That was a part of an ambitious series of policy initiatives, legislation, social safety net, great society. They're bold responses to the specific challenges of the times, just as FMLA did it 30 years ago. What we need to do today, what our job is today, is to continue to work and look at what is the social policy of the day that makes a difference in people's lives. What is the new social safety net for families? It is paid family and medical leave. It is paid sick days. It is affordable child care. It is for equal pay, for equal work for men and women in this country. That is the new social safety net. And for those who think it's a pipe dream only several years ago, we are at the center of the public discourse on these areas. And we need to try harder. We need to fight harder to get it done. And we should not negotiate away and undermine the direction that we want to go in to get these bills passed and across the finish line. I just leave you with this, really. I love being in this building because Francis Perkins is my hero, my hero. Can I just tell you this? When I went to, to um, interview for the position of Secretary of Labor with the then President-elect Obama, was in Chicago on a very cold day, Mr. S Secretary, he said to me, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be Francis Perkins. <laughs> That's what I want to do. So forth. So I didn't get the job, which was okay. I don't think my mother ever forgave him for not doing that, but nevertheless, but nevertheless. But Frances Perkins, the first woman appointed to a presidential cabinet, and she said, and I quote, I came to Washington to work for God, for FDR, and the millions of forgotten, plain, common, working men. I would add women today, but that's what we are tr entrusted to do. We celebrate 30 years of family and medical leave. We celebrate it being paid soon. Every worker deserves paid family and medical leave. And let's make sure it's in the budget that's coming up on March 9th. Um, I thank you for being here today to celebrate with all of you the job. I would just tell you it's a... Um, um, there's nothing better than fighting for workers' rights, for making sure that the working men and women of this country uh, who sacrifice every single day and who today are really so many living paycheck to paycheck, they deserve all of the might and weight of the federal government. For those who fought for the passage, I say thank you. And it's the, the women who were there then. And what's wonderful now, and I've said this to several of you, uh, and I see you there too as well, Carol. And you know, the, it's a new generation of women today joined, et cetera. And it's wonderful for all of the young women who are engaged and involved in this wonderful thing. And all those who continue, let me be clear, 
our work continues because the cause endures. And we will continue to be there to get the job done. And I want you, please, please to join me in welcoming my wonderful, wonderful colleague and a dear friend, and that's Congresswoman Lauren Underwood, who is really a spectacular. Not only family and medical leave, maternal and child care, maternal mortality, the whole nine yards. She is a delight to work with. Lauren. Hi. Thank you, Rosa. Hi, everybody. It is such an honor to be here among so many leaders and advocates who stand up for the rights of working people and their families. Thank you, Secretary Walsh, for inviting me. And to everyone here at the Department of Labor who worked so hard to put this fantastic event together, it's great. <laughs> and um, special thank you to those who shared their personal stories, including Yvonne Lamanji. Over the last week, we've been celebrating the historic nature of this law and what it's meant for working families. And it's those personal stories that have stuck with me. On Friday, we heard President Biden uh, talk about the importance of having federal leave policies and how important it is to have a strong support system, especially for him after he had the horrible accident that took his wife and his daughter's lives all those years ago. My colleague from the Illinois delegation, Senator Tammy Duckworth, spoke this week about how her husband was able to take advantage of FMLA while she recovered from her wounds in Iraq. Yvonne, thank you for sharing your story about your son. Your stories are so vital to illustrating how important these policies are for so many working families, but also where we still need to make progress. My point is this, regardless of your income, your race, your gender identity, or where you come from, whether you're the president of the United States or an emergency room nurse, strong paid leave and job protection policies matter for us all. But there's work to be done because too many Americans are not protected by current law. Tens of millions of people are still being forced to make the difficult choice between their livelihood and caring for themselves or their loved ones. Currently, FMLA protects just 56% of the workforce and gaps in FMLA coverage leave out workers at small employers, folks working one or multiple part-time job positions, and those re-entering the workforce or changing jobs. This means some of our most vulnerable workers are the least likely to be protected, people of color and low-wage workers. These gaps also disproportionately impact women who are more likely to need leave but less likely to be eligible for job-protected leave under FMLA. And so for too many people who are not protected, by the FMLA, their stories are that they lost their job when they became pregnant or sick, or they had to return to work far too soon after having a baby, or they had to work through illness, or they missed precious time spent with a loved one who needed them. And so this 30th anniversary of the Family and Medical Leave Act is an opportunity for us to recognize the hard work of the advocates who worked to make this life-changing law a reality, and those who persist in the fight for families, workers' rights, and economic justice. But this milestone is just a reminder that the FMLA was only a first step, a beginning, and we have more work to do to ensure that all workers can access family and medical leave. 30 years, I think that's long enough to wait. But I know that we're going to get there because the American people are calling for it more loudly now than ever before. And because of the hard work, determination, and personal stories of everyone here today. So thank you again for the honor of joining you in this celebration. And now I'm delighted to pass it back to Deputy Secretary Julie Sue to close us out. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Nice to see you. Okay, thank you all so, so much again for being here. I think it's all been said. Um, it has been a long road and it was amazing to hear Jocelyn, you share and Chair DeLauro, you're such a treasure. Thank you for fighting for us in Congress. Um, uh, talking about the road um, that, that led us to this place. And um, 
it is a beautiful thing to celebrate milestones because it gives people a chance to really remember, uh, to reflect, to come together again. And um, I'll just say again, we've said it many times today, but thank you to all of you who, um, who, who paved the road to um, get us here 30 years ago. And we've also been really clear about the road ahead, right? We talked about what needs to be done. And um, I think Liz said it, she said that we can do, um, we can do it when we have all the pieces put together. And that is what this room is and all the people who are watching. Um, and we've got to bring more, more folks along. You know, in this administration, we talk a lot about infrastructure, physical infrastructure, roads and bridges. But this road to, the, to where we all know we need to go is just as important as our physical roads and bridges. So we are at the Department of Labor are here to fight with you um, to pave that road and um, let's build it together. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for all your work. Thank you to everyone again for sharing in our celebration today, and we now invite you to join us in the Hall of Honor.